you're interested in creating superhero costume designs of your own, or you're just a fan who wants a little historical perspective, then buckle in, super friends, because we're going back in time. Hello, super friends. My name is Annie, and welcome to another episode of Superhero Saturday, where we talk about the arts of superheroes, storytelling, and so much more. In today's video, we are going to traverse the entire length of superhero history, from the golden age of the 1940s to the modern age of the 2020s and beyond. In each chapter, I'll be providing some historical context on each of the different approximate decades that we find ourselves in, some highlights of what was happening in the world and in superhero fiction at the time, and some explanation of different superhero and supervillain costume designs based on the fashion trends of the age. If you want to see each era on its own, as well as examples of new costume designs based on old trends, then you can go ahead and check out those videos on my channel and in the playlist. This has been a labor of love as I've spent the last couple of years researching and examining these different areas in this topic of superhero costume design, so please forgive some of the differences in quality from the different segments. But with all of that out of the way, let's get started at the very beginning of superhero costume design history. The beginning of superheroes as we know them began even before the 20th century with vigilante characters like Robin Hood and fables like the heroes sung by the Greeks. But superheroes by such a name first began to appear in the 1930s in the comic pages of newspapers and then in collections of those comics that would turn into graphic novels and comic books like we know them today. The first big time superhero that is recognizably what we understand as superheroes was, unsurprisingly, Superman, who burst onto the scene in 1938 and was immediately followed by many characters in the same vein. This sparked what was known as the Golden Age of Comics, where stories of superhumans filled the colorful pages of newspapers and comic collections and began to find their way into the hands of millions of readers. By the 1940s, comic book superheroes were undeniably the new big thing. As the world entered the 40s, America entered into the biggest war in history, World War II. Many early superheroes became embroiled in the throes of patriotism, and characters like Captain America were often depicted defending freedom and justice in red, white, and blue. Female characters were also empowered to become heroes, like Wonder Woman, who was just as early and powerful of a frontrunner as her fellow supers. This was a new world, and the colorful superheroes in the pages of newspapers told fantastic stories of good triumphing over evil in an age where hope was in high demand. If we take a look at some of the earliest costume designs of the first superheroes, it's easy to see hints of 1940s fashion. For example, though you wouldn't see someone dressed in tights and a cape on the street, Superman's high-waisted costume and his slicked back hair were standard at that time. His bright patriotic colors were also everywhere and easy to print and recognize. His outside underoos were actually inspired by Victorian era strongmen. And since super strength was his only real power starting out, this made perfect sense to his audience. Superman also started that hero trend with the emblem on his chest. His modern S design wasn't created and copyrighted until 1945, but he always had an S and a shield on his chest, which after having been copied into so many other designs, originated the trend of heroes with logos on the fronts of their costumes. For women, superhero costumes made a little less sense at first glance. If we take a look at the original Wonder Woman costume, we can see that she wears something that's fairly similar to her modern one, with a sleeveless red bodice and star-spangled shorts. Readers often thought she was wearing a skirt, but apparently it was actually intended to be a pair of culottes that were traditionally worn by female athletes. She was also seen wearing Greek-inspired strappy sandals with no heels, all surprisingly practical elements for a female crime fighter. Within a few years, however, she was soon wearing short shorts and high-heeled boots. The 50s tend to be a popular choice for a trip back in time, which between poodle skirts, soda pop, and awesome cars is no surprise. But the shine and shimmer of the 50s is not as awesome as it seems, especially if you are a fan of superheroes. 
At the end of the 1940s and after the conclusion of World War II, the United States declared themselves to be the mighty and heroic global superpower, or basically the Captain America of the world. With the fighting over and the infamous Adolf Hitler six feet under, victorious soldiers flooded home and citizens were anxious to get back to a sense of normalcy and rest on their laurels. For comic book superheroes, whose easiest and most popular villains included Nazis of any variety, this shift in the atmosphere prompted a need for redirection. Although Americans considered themselves to be strong and happy and virtuous, the repercussions of a world torn apart by war soon began to rumble through the culture. Soldiers traumatized by battle had to figure out a way to transition back to civilian life, despite the horrors they had seen. Women and minorities who had been empowered in the power vacuum left by military recruits were being pressured back into traditional roles. Global politics and national relations had to grapple with a new world order, framed by the power to completely obliterate the human race with the namesake of this era, the atomic bomb. Despite the success of the post-war economy and the shiny new future promised to the nuclear family, the American dream was more shallow than people cared to realize. Soon the United States found out that being king of the hill only means that everyone else becomes a competitor and therefore a threat. Guilt, trauma, and paranoia soon found its way into the very foundations of American culture, and therefore into the comic book world as well. With the combination of these dark cultural undertones, a double dose of denial and escapism, and an audience that had already consumed its fill of cartoonish anti-Nazi crusades, the comic book world was desperate to hold on to its audience. One of the ways they did so was to expand their content into other genres. The most popular of these were horror, crime, westerns, and romance. These were often written and printed in huge numbers with wide varieties of short-running stories in an attempt to keep the audience's attention. The content soon came to be known as pulp fiction, which was just as shallow as the American dream. Only a handful of superhero stories actually continued during this time period between the 40s and the 50s. They included Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman, and very few others. Even superheroes with their own serial headlines were cut for gruesome unsupernatural crime and cowboys riding off into the sunset. Soon there were so few superheroes around, one might wonder whether the genre was no more than a passing fad that would disappear almost as soon as it had burst onto the scene. The superhero stories that remained during this time shifted gears to include other things that Americans were hearing about on the news, hoping to remain relevant. There were plot points based on aliens, nuclear science, and a new type of generic villain, communists. When America split ties with their former World War II allies, tension between the West and Russia grew exponentially and seeped into popular culture. The only thing that seemed to keep the Cold War from sparking an explosion was the logical conundrum of mutually assured destruction. The idea that if either side fired first, they would doom themselves. Even with the obvious cultural dampener this put on the industry, the comic book companies did plenty to nuke their own development. <laughs> Nuke. DC Comics sued Fawcett Comics over the character Captain Marvel, which DC claimed was a ripoff of their own Superman. They won that legal battle, and with ownership of the rights secured, they essentially eradicated that character from existence. In spite of his popularity after punching Adolf Hitler in the face, Captain America got cut out of his own series and was replaced by much more mundane stories. And then, get this, when a female version of Cap appeared in the back pages of a different comic and became popular with teenage girls, Marvel Comics, known at the time as Timely Comics, misunderstood the draw of this character and turned the budding Miss America story into an uninspired teen drama about dances and dating. They could have finally gotten hold of the teen girl superhero market, but instead they translated that into a cheap marketing ploy based on what little girls should want to read about. Sound familiar, ladies? With all of this greed, paranoia, and desperation, it's no wonder superheroes almost lost their footing in popular culture during the Atomic Age of Comics. 
1950s and 1960s was an era of change. There was tons of polarization in American society and the world about what we were doing as humans who were interconnected across the world with each other to move us into the future. We were now looking forward to a future that we could realize for ourselves. And that meant a lot of people were very intent on making a future that was worth living for. Unfortunately, a better future means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. In an era that was rife with conflict, including the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights Movement, Second Wave Feminism, and so many other changes in society, things were just crazy all over. But thankfully, a lot of people did push into what was better because out of this era, we got a lot of better rights for a lot of different types of people. We had the anti-war movement that influenced a lot of pacifism in the United States. And we did have a lot of technological advancements that were reflected in a lot of different types of media, especially science fiction, including the start of Star Trek, the original series, which I drew a lot of influence from for this later costume. Though this era later came to be known as the Marvel Age of Comics, the revitalization of superhero media actually did start with DC Comics. In the late 1950s, DC Comics got all their three main superhero characters together on one comic title, which was under the group The Justice League of America. This team dynamic spread throughout the series made for a lot more interesting storytelling because it wasn't just about these three individual heroes doing their own business, but about how they related with each other. It also featured a lot of crossover content, which was great because it helped fans to branch out into other areas and bring each other in on the stories that they love. Then the Justice League of America started to grow and pull in characters from other eras, like the revitalized Flash character and the completely redesigned Green Lantern. Over at Marvel Comics, which actually was wasn't even a competitor at this time with DC Comics because they didn't even have any superhero titles to their name and their distribution was owned by DC Comics. There was a push to create a superhero team like the Justice League, but new and different to kind of start to capitalize on that popularity. Cue superhero comics legend Stan freaking Lee and his whole team of creators. When Stan Lee got the call to create a new team of superheroes, he was actually thinking of switching careers at the time. The superhero industry had virtually disappeared and he just wasn't really having very much fun. His wife, however, gave him the brilliant idea to at least go out of the industry with a bang. He's got this new assignment, he might as well do a comic the way that he thinks that they should be done. So Stan threw all caution to the winds and put together this new team of superhero characters that had never previously been seen sort of, called the Fantastic Four. Not only was this a team of superheroes, but it was also a family of superheroes. They all operate as a family who knows each other's identities, whose identities are not secret, and whose powers are thrust upon them by this crazy scientific accident which was totally in place for the time, especially at the end of the 50s when all of this new science was still a really big deal. Another thing that they did with the Fantastic Four was to design the characters around actual personalities first, rather than start off with a gimmicky superpower. All of these characters really had superpowers that were seen before in the comics world. The Human Torch was actually a previous character, and a stretchy, flexible man was not a new thing either. However, these individual personalities are what compelled the story forward, rather than just the latest bad guy that somebody has to stop. These are characters with real personalities, real quirks, real character flaws, and real conflicts, especially with each other. In the end, it was the story first, and the art and everything else kind of followed after that. In fact, the Marvel method of story writing is focused very heavily on team collaboration. Oftentimes, what Stan Lee would do was sketch out a very brief synopsis, sometimes even over the phone, and tell his artists what kind of wanted to happen throughout the course of the story. And then the artist might sometimes ask, well, then what happens in the pages in between? And Stan Lee would say, I don't know, make something up. Some artists really thought that this lack of structure was weird and they didn't really like it. At other companies, they would just get handed a script line for line and have to draw that and fit that in. But Stan Lee recognized the creativity of his people. 
he recognized that they had great potential for taking the story and adding to it whatever they wanted to. So he gave them the freedom to do so. And the artists who were at Marvel Comics at the time really grabbed onto this and ran with it. Stanley and his team were also actually a big force in the diversification of comics as well. Remember in the 1960s, this was the heat of the civil rights movement and everything was kind of in flux, but Stan Lee, being a lover of people and personalities, wanted to see that represented in his media. So, legend has it, on a bet, Stan Lee created Nick Fury and the Howling Commandos. This team was specifically diverse with characters that were from all sorts of different ethnic backgrounds. Stanley also started to reach far and wide with his new method of creating superheroes. And at this time, we saw the creation of a ton of different characters, including the Hulk, Doctor Strange, Thor, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Black Panther, and of course, the iconic Spider-Man. And because Marvel's distribution was owned by DC, they were actually legally only allowed to release eight superhero related titles a month. So they could hardly even cram all of these stories into the pages of the comic books they were allowed to put out. DC of course capitalized on this as well and the back and forth between Marvel and DC spurred them both on to create even more great superhero comics for the media to consume. Comic books were flying off the shelves, sometimes in the millions at a time. And soon the horror and scary type crazy stories started to go their own ways. This was helped in part by the Comics Code Authority, which was created in the late 1950s as a response to the crazy outlandish stories that they were producing in place of superhero comics. These often showed very graphic scenes, and so the Comics Code Authority was the equivalent of a rating system. And if you had a Comics Code Authority stamp on the cover of your comic book, that meant that it was quote unquote safe enough for children. In spite of this and the fact that superhero comics were traditionally viewed as a medium for children, the fact that they were putting personality first in their storytelling and actually focusing on relationships that were relatable meant that a lot of these comics started getting a much wider, more intelligent audience, including college kids. But then again, we were also brought the uh, 1960s Batman TV show. All in all, by the end of the 1960s, it was clear that superhero stories had come back to stay. This decade was as interesting a time in America as any other. After the revolution of the 60s, this new era was marked by a shift away from the psychedelic and also a backlash from a turbulent period of revolution. In politics, this clear division was characterized by a desire to return back to traditional values. The new right, or so-called silent majority, yes kids, this phrase is almost as old as the boomers who continue to use it to this day, claimed that equal rights were an affront to the white picket fence American ideal. And so they fought against both big government influences like affirmative action and desegregation and the continued integration and empowerment of oppressed people groups. It's never easy to convince people who previously held power in a culture to accept those they used to exploit for their own gain, even passively, and this time period was no exception. Because of this backlash, many hard-won freedoms of the 60s experienced a loss in footing in the 70s. On the other hand, there were also continued concerted efforts to roll out liberty and justice for all, including people outside the United States. Protests were still happening everywhere, from the Vietnam War to the War on Drugs, and the Equal Rights Amendment that guaranteed all freedoms for women. The ERA, which was first proposed in 1923, was finally approved by Congress in the 1960s. Spoiler alert, the ERA still to this day has not been ratified by all 50 states and is not part of the US Constitution. That means the only right guaranteed by our national government is the right for women to vote, which is included in the 19th Amendment. These weren't the only big shifts in American culture in the 1970s, especially in the world of superhero comics. The old Silver Age artists who defined a new wave of superhero stories were moving up, moving over, or moving on, and a new generation began to fill their seats in the bullpen. 
These new artists were from a generation that had always known the television screen and comic books alike, and were beginning to learn what the digital revolution would be. They were often even lifelong fans of the stories they were now working to produce, and that gave them the knowledge and the freedom to experiment with them as they would. They would often pitch lucrative crossovers to their audiences, even going as far as to cross over with competing comic book publishers, movie characters, and real life people. Another way these new artists refined their genre was by getting rid of a lot of the fantastic and goofy elements from their most prolific characters. For example, many elements of the kryptonite rainbow, including many of Superman's more superfluous superpowers, were mixed at this time. There was also a push toward realism and relevance in the 1970s. One of the best examples of this was the classic story of Stan Lee versus the Comics Code Authority. The 70s was the beginning of the so-called War on Drugs, which was a big push against the drug abuse that had proliferated during the previous decade. So a lot of superhero writers naturally wanted to show this conflict in their stories. However, the Comics Code Authority was still working hard to regulate content, and according to their rules, no mention of drugs was allowed if the comic was to be considered family-friendly, even if they cast the use of drugs in a negative light. During this time, the U.S. government approached Stan Lee himself and asked him to write a comic book series with an anti-drug message. This seemed impossible, Stan thought, because if he wrote anything to do with drugs, he would get censored immediately by the CCA. Stan believed in the message, though, and in the educational power of storytelling, so he and his team crafted a great Spider-Man story showing the negative impact of drug abuse without being preachy. They published the story in spite of CCA disapproval, and it turned out to be a huge success. Of course the story was relatable to the readers at the time, especially young ones. And this first step paved the way for future stories in the same vein. It also caused the CCA to loosen its grip on the industry and gave creators a new breath of freedom. In my opinion, this is one of the ultimate defining moments in superhero history. There were plenty of other breakthroughs in the Bronze Age, however, not all of them successful. Especially in the relaunch of the X-Men series in 1975, we began to see a whole slew of female and POC characters that were invented, repurposed, and popularized during this time hit characters like Luke Cage, Vixen, and Shang-Chi. There were a whole lot of misses too. Characters like Red Sonja began popping up everywhere, sacrificing the integrity of inclusivity on the altar of sexual appeal. Since fanboys now filled the seats at both Marvel and DC, and the CCA had lightened its grip, everyone wanted to draw more skin and more shallowness than was necessary, which was a timeless blow to oppressed peoples everywhere. However, in spite of the ups and downs, both in the superhero world and in history itself, the Bronze Age of the 1970s was a time of artistic growth and expression that would leave its groovy mark on history. The world of the 1980s. This era of American pop culture history is a famous one. Computers were gaining traction, Reaganomics promoted the middle class American dream, the Cold War kept us on our toes, but overall it was a time of cultural groundbreakers and material prosperity. At home, sitcoms showed slices of life in convenient half hour slots. At the movies, Steven Spielberg created classic after classic. Though there were dangerous undercurrents for this generation, life in America was always portrayed with bright optimism. And everything was big. Big hair, big music, and big dreams. During this time, superhero fiction was even more mainstream than ever, thanks to the diligent work of hardworking creators like Stan Lee of Marvel Comics. There were toy deals, TV shows, movies, and of course, comic books all over the world. And everything seemed to be home to the classic superheroes. One of the biggest developments in the business of superheroes, however, was the advent of brick and mortar comic book stores. While previously most comics were produced with the idea that they would go directly to newsstands to be purchased, by now comics had been popular for long enough that business owners developed entire storefronts to the sale of vintage and collectible works. Marvel Studios capitalized on this and began to create comics specifically for these comic book stores, until this system of sale became the new standard. 
This also meant that there were enough people who honestly loved comics and appreciated them as an art form that the industry itself began treating it as such. The 1980s saw the advent of giving these creators the respect they deserved. DC began to give writers part of the share of sales in addition to their usual pay once the comic stories they were working on passed the 100,000 sell mark, something that had never been done before in the industry. Marvel soon copied this process, and even though it cost them barrels of money at first, it was worth it in the end. They retained fantastic artists, developed a culture of good attitudes, attracted new artists, and subsequently made exponentially more money. It was really a good deal all around for everyone. Especially comic book fans, who got even better quality content than ever before. In a similar vein, as a contrast to the previous pulp fiction phases of comic book history, more and more superhero stories found themselves in the pages of graphic novels. These works of art collected longer story arcs into one piece, and were printed on high-quality paper with glossy pages and fine ink. Fans who had always appreciated these works, even when they were small-scale, were now able to see their favorite characters in living color. It was a great time for solidifying the art of comic books into the annals of art history. The superhero characters themselves were also gaining a new tilt in this era. Because superheroes were such a big deal all on their own, and as a now obviously enduring story form, characters new and old began to pop up with different takes on the classic cape and mask good guy archetype, though only slightly. The Dark Phoenix saga, for example, which was arguably one of the biggest story arcs of the decade, told an insanely huge tale that ended with a conclusion that no one, not even the writers, saw coming. The main character for the series, who had once been a prominent hero with the X-Men, had been taken over by a ridiculously overpowered villain who was committing egregious crimes against humanity. The writers realized they had basically written themselves into a corner because there had to be real, concrete consequences for these actions for the characters that were involved in the story. In a contrast to the after-school specials that were airing on television at the time, the comic book writers realized that nothing could return to normal for these characters. Other characters also saw a darker, more personal tilt to their stories. Daredevil, created in 1979, was designed to show a different idea of a superhero who was extraordinarily daring and passionate, but also a little ridiculous in his choices. Additionally, his small-scale urban plight working in Hell's Kitchen showed a much more focused character that was a change of pace for an industry that had previously banked on cross-promotion and humongous team-ups. Over in the world of DC, the Batman stories were similarly darker and more brooding which paved the way for the groundbreaking, genre-defining Batman movie of 1989. But more of that when we get to the 1990s. As far as fashion goes, the 1980s were as big as it gets. Big hair, bright colors, radical patterns, and dramatic poses found their way into superhero costumes. As an interesting contrast, not many classic superhero costumes were extensively altered during this time probably because fans finally appreciated the history and wanted some consistency in their stories. However, as always, the style of the time shows up in the finer details. After the neon colors, big hair, and radical historical events of the 1980s, the 90s constituted both a culmination of these changes and a teaser for the new millennium to come. There were supersized meals at McDonald's, Furbies under every Christmas tree, and a new plastic toy and home video game for all the latest pop culture kid stories, like Harry Potter, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Pokemon. Compared to some of the previous decades, it was an era of relative peace, prosperity, and progress. The Cold War had come to a close, the apartheid in South Africa ended, the Mall of America and the internet both opened to the public, and the world was looking forward to a bright new future. But it wasn't all Lisa Frank, rainbows, and unicorns. The drug trade in America became a dark undercurrent to society. The AIDS crisis showed people that we weren't invincible, even to the smallest of things. Those in the highest levels of government, from President Clinton to Princess Diana, found themselves as fallible as the people they led. Even the superhero world experienced its boom and bust in record speed, which led to one historian calling it 
the most interesting decade in comic book history. Of course, history rarely ever splits along numerical lines, and the changes in story for the 90s took root much earlier. For example, the 1989 Batman movie by Tim Burton seemingly reinvented one of the most iconic superhero characters, at least in the public eye. Those who had previously known only the bright colors and jazzy tunes of Adam West, and even Christopher Reeve's Superman, were startled by this grittier take on a beloved hero. But like the sudden popularity of grunge, the extreme generation was taking its chance to make a statement. This change was reflected and predated in comic books in many ways. Instead of guaranteeing that the hero would save the day by the end of the issue, comic book companies like publishing giants Marvel and DC began reaching further and further for more radical interpretations of their classic characters in the 90s. Major storylines included Spider-Man being replaced by a clone, darker versions of Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and The Flash, and even Batman getting his back broken. It proved that the writers would go to extreme heights to make their stories stand out. Specifically, the Death of Superman storyline in which the iconic hero is killed off in his own series and remains dead for several subsequent stories was so genre-breaking that it sold out and made national news. Many critics claim these ridiculous stories are merely publicity stunts that cause short-term spikes in sales and offer little value. Yeah, they're not going to kill Superman. I think they do it just to get money, and then, like, he's going to revive in two days. There's too much money tied up in Superman for him to stay dead forever. And in many cases, this is true for the 1990s. After 50-some-odd years, to get people to notice, sometimes you have to go to extremes. Although many darker and more serious undertones of these superhero tales reflected the struggles of the time and offered a new perspective, the business world had certainly turned its greedy gaze to comics. In the same decade that set the Beanie Baby craze into motion, comic book publishers doubled down on encouraging fans to treat comics as financial investments rather than entertainment. Original issues of classic comics could be bought and sold for ridiculous profit margins at this point, so why shouldn't the latest issue of X-Men hold the same value? To this end, they created variant covers of the same issues, exclusive crossovers, and even hollow foil editions, which is why this era is sometimes referred to as the Chrome Age of Comics, and is probably why hollow is my favorite color. All of this to convince people to buy as many of these issues as possible. And it worked! For a while, people were buying these limited edition products left and right, often in multiples, and collecting comics became a true American pastime. The problem was they forgot the limited part of limited edition. Oversaturation of the market meant there was a lot of supply and therefore not as much demand, even with special editions. Another tactic to garner extra sales, which was writing gimmicky one-off stories, constituted only ridiculous, out-of-universe ploys for attention that were visible to even the newest comic book fan. Even worse, poor imitators tried to jump on the bandwagon with all style and no substance, making it harder to find something worth reading or watching. The blatant consumerism was so present that even children's television had to be reined in. The Children's Television Act update of 1996 was designed to put a cap on the ridiculous practice of companies advertising tie-in toys and products that aired during the shows they tied into. So basically you would be just watching Pokemon and then on the commercial break they would say, here, buy this little Pikachu. I mean, how are kids supposed to deal with that? This changed the way many popular kids' shows were programmed on cable television, especially for Saturday morning superhero cartoons. On top of these commercialization problems, there were also internal issues within the comic book industry itself. Shipping and printing problems, bad staffing decisions, and shifts in creation and distribution left many stories and fans high and dry. And in 1996, even bankrupted the publishing giant Marvel in the Great Comics Crash. Yes, apparently 1996 was a big year. Remarkably, the originators of the Avengers franchise we know and love were flat broke less than 30 years before they made the record-breaking blockbuster movies of the same characters. Oddly enough, while the superhero genre was going bust and established companies went to more and more extreme lengths to recapture their audience, new stories found their way into the market. It was a new age of experimentation. Anything was possible, as long as it was ridiculously over the top. Independent presses were forming everywhere, giving voice to stories from people who had previously been lost in the battle of Marvel vs. DC. These include publishers like Tundra, Valiant, 
Image, and even Dark Horse. Some of these found their footing, and others went the way of the pager. One company in particular, called Milestone Comics, was founded by four black men and gave voice to many stories of and about people of color, including my personal favorite superhero, Static. It was a good time for artists to learn to break free of the old comic tropes. One more thing to note about superheroes in the 90s was that live-action superhero movies were starting to find more of a footing. The Tim Burton Batman movies changed the way the public saw heroes and villains. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, once a dark playoff of Marvel's Daredevil, now featured much more kid-friendly and market-friendly productions. And the 1998 Blade movie garnered commercial success, even with its strong supernatural and horror themes. It showed us that the development of better special effects could potentially lead to even better live-action representation of the fantastical stories that comic book lovers wanted to see on screen. Many comic stories and styles had come, established themselves, and broken completely out of their shells, which meant it was time for a clean slate in the new millennium. As the calendar ticked over to the second millennium, many people were looking forward to a fresh new world full of progress. In the first decade of the 2000s, there were many advances, especially in the world of information technology. Space exploration reached new heights. In America, cell phones became much more widespread. iPods, iPads, and iPhones hit the scene. Digital animation was all over the media. And finally, a new wave of interconnectivity hit the scene with Web 2.0, which is a wider focus on user-generated internet content or social media rather than media put out and assembled by companies. We're talking MySpace, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all of those social media platforms that we know and love and some of which we lost. The decade started off a little rocky in America, of course, with the 9-11 terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. This impacted the country in innumerable ways that had consequences for the rest of the decade, including in the world of superhero fiction. There were also large-scale natural disasters, an increased polarization of the bipartisan political scene, and a housing crisis that left millions of Americans wondering where they would live. But in the midst of all this, we did get our first black president, so that was pretty cool. This combination of futurism and tension lent an interesting tilt to this generation of superhero fiction, especially on screens everywhere. There was a bit of a split between realistic, leather-clad, dark superheroes and hyper-colorized, nostalgic, and animated superheroes. Both of these styles found really solid ground in the 2000s popular media. This also meant more and more superheroes' stories found their way to the big screen, many of which relied heavily on the improved CGI available at the time. Movies like The Dark Knight Trilogy, Daredevil, Ghost Rider, Hellboy, Blade, X-Men, and Hancock showed us superheroes in less cartoony costumes and more leather bodysuits, hence the name The Leather Age. And Smallville, the show that laid the groundwork for the DCEU, showed us a fledgling Superman without the tights. For stories set in this style, there was more of an emphasis on perceived realism, or at least less blind optimism. These characters wore costumes that were more pragmatic, or at least less flashy, and they dealt with evils that threatened gray areas. Although I'm not personally a huge fan of this style, I can't appreciate how much it contributed to a more holistic perspective in many superhero stories, and pushed people to think about good and evil, and more importantly, the challenging areas in between. Plus, the costumes really made the leap from, you know, comic book pages to something that you might actually see in the real world. So that was definitely a bonus. On the other side of the coin, in a surprise move, the 2000s saw a huge boom in traditional animated superheroes, stuff that was a little bit more nostalgic. The DC animated universe, which started in the 90s with Batman and Superman, expanded to include movies and multi-show crossovers. Superman, Batman, Batman Beyond, the Justice League, and Static Shock joined forces on the small screen to fight crime and save the world, in costumes that were reminiscent of their previous era counterparts. Ben 10 made his first debut in this decade, along with Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. And straddling the difference between gritty and cartoony was the Teen Titans show. Though not in the same miniverse as the rest of the DC animated universe, it did leave its mark on many young audiences. 
Add on top of this the retro and Technicolor Incredibles, and it's clear that bright colors and golden era nostalgia created a clear pattern for animated or CGI'd heroes in the 2000s. In America and worldwide, the economy was still reeling from the housing crisis of 2007 and 2008 and all of its side effects, which earned it the nickname the Great Recession. This led to a series of social pushbacks called the Occupy movements, where people began protesting socioeconomic inequality and calling out megacorporations and other big money entities for disproportionately controlling the world's wealth and therefore the direction of the world's future. At the same time, fear of more economic hardship spurred the election of controversial celebrity businessman Donald Trump as President of the United States, despite his myriad personal shortcomings. On the flip side, though, social awareness became much more prominent in this era, especially in the media, as movements for LGBTQ plus and women's rights continued to push ahead. Better representation in movies, TV shows, and other popular media diversified our collective storytelling and paved the way for better interpersonal relations in the West and beyond. This was spurred ahead by the increased globalization in the world that was made possible by leaps and bounds in technology. Everything was going wireless, and now more than ever, people came to terms with the fact that the world is a much bigger, more kaleidoscopic place than previously imagined. Instead of being tied to physical places and devices with DVDs, CDs, and cable television hookups, people everywhere were streaming the same content on the internet. From Netflix to Disney+, Plus and YouTube to Facebook, and Spotify to Apple Music. Not to mention, of course, the booming YouTube culture. And here we are. It was also the birth of one of my personal favorite 2010s inventions, the game of Minecraft, which created a truly international virtual sandbox for gamers to play in together, in whatever ways they could dream up. Of course, we can't talk about international cultural communication without talking about superheroes, because it was truly the age of superhero movies. Marvel took the lead on much of this, of course, starting with the release of Iron Man in 2008 and then building onto this cinematic universe with movie after movie in the same story. Iron Man was followed by Thor, Captain America, the Guardians of the Galaxy, another new take on Spider-Man, Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Black Widow, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Captain Marvel, and more. This was something that had never been done on this level before, a web of interconnected stories built on multiple feature films. Plus, it was a superhero story! It all ended up in a massive two-part climax at the end of the decade with Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, which premiered with great anticipation around the world and became the highest grossing film of all time. This boom in popularity and multiple story crossover storytelling wasn't just happening over at Marvel either. In comics, interconnectivity and teamwork were more important than ever. DC even went so far as to reinvent their superhero universe in the comics twice in this decade in order to capture new audiences living in our new world. This was the New 52 and Rebirth story arcs. They also took a stab at their own cinematic universe, although they blazed a different kind of trail than Marvel. Wonder Woman became the first female-led superhero blockbuster that wasn't based on a male character, and their subsequent takes were also similarly more diverse than the traditionally straight white male track that Marvel kind of got stuck in for a little while. As I think is pretty typical of DC from their history, they did much better creative work on TV rather than in the theaters. On the CW, the Arrowverse connected shows as far back as Smallville and as far ranging as Legends of Tomorrow and Black Lightning. With multiple show crossover events that took place over the course of an entire week, this created a massive collection of stories that pulled in characters with wide ranging tones, backstories, and reinventions. Overall, the 2010s had a few major trends in superhero storytelling. First, live action mediums finally had the technology and the perspective to create superhero stories that made sense. Second, having interconnected stories and characters provided more comprehensive universes of content that better reflected the globalization of the decade. And superhero storytelling finally opened up and was popular enough to create more cultural recognition of superhero subgenres. And that is going to lead us into our discussion of superhero costume trends of the 2010s. With the onslaught of so many live action superhero stories in popular media, it became easier than ever to see that there were different types of superhero stories that couldn't be defined just by the category superhero. 
There's action-adventure superhero, space and sci-fi superhero, gritty dark superhero, fantasy superhero, historical fiction superhero, superhero comedy. Basically, any genre you can think of, you can tell a superhero story in. That means that costumes aren't all the same campy, colorful, simplistic spandex bodysuits. They now tend to reflect more of their subgenre than ever before. That means a gritty superhero might wear more dark colors, more armor, and more weaponry, as opposed to a space superhero who might don brighter colors, more tech, and maybe more old school space age stylings. You'll still find outfits that reflect the near 100 years of historical costumes, but in the 2010s they more often replaced the skin tight spandex with that fake leathery material that looks more durable and slightly less form fitting. No one really nails down what it's called, but you, you know what it looks like. Because it's everywhere. However, in spite of the continued development of better social progressiveness, there were still a fair number of issues around female superhero costumes at this time. Some of our favorite major Marvel players like Black Widow, Captain Marvel, and The Wasp did manage to get full body coverage in their big screen adaptations, if not some tweaks that we would rather they not have done. In the end, though, the Wonder Woman movie did what I think was the best compromise between the character's history, actual historical accuracy, and utility. By this I mean that her costume did look recognizably like Wonder Woman, but it was also stylized armor that served an apparent purpose, and it didn't actually reveal too much when she had all of the pieces assembled. With the whole costume on, we really only see one shoulder, her upper arms, aka her guns, and a little bit above her kneecaps. And the rest of the Amazons in that movie followed suit with realistic armor and a wide variety of actual strong women playing their parts. Unfortunately for us, in their appearances in the Justice League movie and other adaptations, they were definitely a little bit more back into the less positive, more male gaze-y versions. But two steps forward and one step back is still one step forward, I guess? So let's keep trying, DC. The most distinct element of this period of history, of course, is the COVID-19 pandemic, which really started shutting things down almost at the offset of the 20s themselves. One of the biggest historical markers in generations, this pandemic was the most widespread illness in a hundred years. And in all our modern wisdom, we did our best to do what was best for everyone, which was shut everything down for literal years. I won't go into too much detail because honestly, it's still a little too soon for any of that, but suffice it to say that the pandemic shutdown had a huge impact on the way we view the world and accordingly, the way we create art. After the box office boom of the blockbuster era of superheroes in the 2010s, Hollywood had to face the shutdowns they feared would never happen. If people couldn't come to the movie theaters to watch their productions when they came out, then how would they make money? And probably the better question, how could they make movies when people were literally risking their lives even being in the same room together, much less acting out fight scenes and other very intimate, close contact scenarios? You guys got a sec? I need to talk to you about something. Whatever it is, gonna wait, Rosie, you're gonna wanna see this. Question, what is the number one problem with the coronavirus? Mass death, economic collapse, the way the disease has exposed the systemic injustice at the core of American life. Well, yes, obviously those, but after that, it's how to high five your friends while staying six feet apart. The solution, of course, was already kind of taken care of. With the increased interconnectivity brought to us by wireless internet and the power of streaming, that meant movies and other media content could be piped directly into people people's homes where they were locked down and trying not to think too hard about the state of the world. Eventually this led to a near complete retrofitting of traditional media sharing commerce. And with everyone everywhere sharing what little information they had with the world, it was, if you can believe it, yet another increase in our level of international globalization. Storytellers took that and the increased diversity of the 2010s into the future. Now you could find superhero stories in any medium, in any tone or subgenre, on any platform, and from a whole bunch more different origins. On Disney+, Plus, Marvel expanded and experimented with their multiverse. They created stories that were catered to more and different audience sub-segments, 
with shows like WandaVision, Loki, Hawkeye, Moon Knight, Miss Marvel, She-Hulk, and more. They expanded on diverse characters and story arcs that hadn't gotten the big screen go-ahead yet, and fans began to see more of themselves in their favorite universe, in different subgenres that hadn't gotten as much attention before. So far, it's been a whirlwind of great, diverse content, and it's looking really good for the future, despite, uh, sometimes the state that the world is in. If you've made it all the way to the end of the video, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video or if you found it helpful in some way, go ahead and give us a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you want to see more superheroic content like this in the future. Although most of the videos are not nearly this long. And if you want to see my own superheroes in action in their own time periods, then you can check out our website at www.fearless9.com. Thanks again for watching Super Friends and we'll see you next time.